Okay, our lesson for this day, this is the last Sunday of the Epiphany season, and uh, which is the season that follows Christmas. Remember Christmas? Well, first you have Advent, four weeks, then you have Christmas, 12 days. Then you have Epiphany, which can vary anywhere from six, seven, eight weeks, uh, even, I think even nine. Depends on when Easter comes. But uh, this year, Epiphany was six weeks long. This is the last <coughs> Sunday of Epiphany, and it is the Sunday in the church year when we remember the event of the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration. I'm going to read about it, and then we're going to we're going to think about it. After six days, this is from Mark chapter nine, starting at verse two. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and he led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no floor on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah and Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, the disciples no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would impart your holy word through my words and the meditations of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this was really an important event. Uh, this occurred actually near the time when the latter part of Jesus' ministry was to begin. And so he took three of his disciples up to a high place, up in a mountain. We call it the Mount of the Transfiguration. And uh, it's interesting, first of all, to notice who he took with him. He took John and his brother James. They were brothers. They were the sons of Zebedee. And I think they were the first two disciples that Jesus called. And, of course, John was the beloved disciple. Remember that? Uh, John was especially close to Jesus. And uh, so he's sometimes called the beloved disciple. And, of course, it was John that was the only disciple there at the foot of the cross on Good Friday. All the others had left, but John stayed there at the foot of the cross, and as he was seated there, I think they probably, because they wouldn't have stood all day, but probably was sitting down somehow, some way, but who was next to him? Yeah, oh. See, they've been reading their Bible. Yeah, Mary. Mary was next to John. And that tells us a little bit more about that special relationship. And then one of
one of the words that Jesus spoke from the cross, remember, he said, Son, behold your mother. <clears throat> he said that to John. And then he said to his mother, Behold your son. Okay? So we know, we know that John was the one that Jesus asked to take care of his mother in the years ahead. Of course, we don't know, we don't know exactly uh, how long Mary lived. We don't know a lot of details. Uh, but we don't have to. We all, we know everything we need to know. So, uh, John was the beloved disciple, and James his brother. Then, of course, Peter. Uh oh, we got to have him. Because he was the one that Jesus put in charge, in many ways, of the disciples after he ascended, would ascend into heaven, right? Now, do we have any Catholic uh, brothers and sisters here today? Any Catholics? Yeah. Good. Good. Welcome. The Catholic Church believes that Peter was the first pope. And I understand that. I see exactly where they get that. Because Jesus said to Peter... You are the rock, and upon you I will build my church. Now, in the Protestants, we say, well, but maybe Jesus meant his faith, his confession. I will build my church on your confession of faith. Because uh, Peter was the one that said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, but it can be interpreted either way. I think that part of the reason that uh, Luther, Martin Luther, one of the, the, you know, really the earliest leader of the Reformation, I think part of the reason that he uh, chose to interpret it a different way was because he didn't like the Pope. <laughs> right? I, I mean, at the time, uh, they didn't get along. But, I, thankfully, those days are over. I grew up in a time when, uh, you know, especially on Reformation Sunday, the Lutheran minister was expected to kind of hammer the Catholics. I never did like that. I don't think it's necessary. And uh, then when I went out and married a French Catholic, I was really, <laughs> I was really happy. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Peter was there because, however you understand it, it's clear that Peter was the first leader of the church. And so he was there. Now, the next thing we want to look at is the other two that were there. There were the three disciples, and Jesus and his garments were glistening. They were white as snow. And... Uh, and then, as he was there, all of a sudden, two others were there. Now, those two men had been, uh, well, Moses died about, let me see, about 1,250 years or so before that time. And Elijah, he would have been gone about, oh, five, six hundred years. So what were they doing? And they were there. Now here again, we've got to remember how to read our Bibles. You read the Bible and you go with what it says. Because if you don't do that, you get in all kinds of trouble. If you start kind of, oh, well, but it really, they weren't really there. They just thought they were. That's nonsense. Just go with what it says. Right? I mean, if Jesus can heal the deaf, give sight to the blind, enable the lame to run, and, and uh, deliver people from demons, and touch lepers, and heal them, if Jesus can perform all the miracles that he performed that we read about in the Bible, and if God
God can create the world, and he did create the world, and oh my goodness gracious. So we, we don't dispute any of the miracles. We, what the Bible says, Elijah and Moses were there, then they were there. Period. Now why were they there? This is very important. Moses was the great lawgiver. When you think of the law, you think of Moses. Because it was to Moses that God gave the Ten Commandments. Right? Remember, they were out in the wilderness. Moses went up on the mountain. He got the Ten Commandments. He came down and the people were misbehaving. He got mad, smashed them. But then he went and got them again. So he's the lawgiver. Now, by the time of Jesus, the law had just exploded. It wasn't just ten commandments. It wasn't even a hundred commandments. It was 630 laws had developed over the years. There were laws about everything. I've said this before. Laws of there were laws about what you could eat, but there were also laws about what you could put on the same plate. Kosher laws? Man, just laws, laws, ceremonial laws, sacrificial laws, dietary laws. <coughs> Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. Okay? There have been prophets going all the way back to uh, Amos and Hosea. They were prophets of the northern kingdom. Uh, there were Micah. There were all kinds of prophets. There were 12 minor prophets, they're called. And then there were three major prophets. And these prophets, they had been foretelling <coughs> The coming of the Savior. Now, the people hadn't understood it very well. We understand it much better because we have the advantage of hindsight. We can look back and see, oh, yeah, now I see how it's fitting together. <clears throat> they had said that the day would come when the fourth promise that... God had given to Abraham would be fulfilled. Remember that? God said, you're going to have many descendants, you're going to have your own land, you're going to become a great nation, and number four, you are going to be a blessing to all the world. I'm going to bless all the world through you. How would he do that? By giving his only begotten son. That's how he did it. Now, the reason that Moses and Elijah were on the mountain, it will become very clear if we look at the next part. So they're up there. Peter, being the impetuous one, he always wanted to do something. Right? I mean, he wasn't like the other disciples. The man couldn't sit still. Remember when Jesus came walking to the disciples on the water? <coughs> And it was a storm. Jesus is walking on the water. The other disciples, they stay in the boat, which is probably where all of us would be. We were afraid. What's going on? And now we see Jesus walking on the water, which would probably make us even more afraid, although we're glad to see him. But what does Peter do? He doesn't stay quiet. He doesn't just keep his trap shut. He says, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. Nobody else says it. I think Jesus, you know, just deciding to humor him a little bit, said, okay, Peter, come. <laughs> Peter steps out of the boat. He takes one step and starts to sink. Remember, it's right in there. I always think that is, that's a great story. I wonder, 
You know, I'm kind of impetuous. Sometimes I can't keep my trap shut, right? I wonder, I wouldn't have been like him, though. I might have. And then I would have said, right? So he was the impetuous one. So up at the mountain, the others, they're just, what, James and John are sitting. They don't know what to think. And Peter has to say something. So he says, well, oh, it's a good thing we're here. We'll build three booths. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. We'll build three booths. It was at that moment that the voice spoke out of heaven. The cloud came over him. And the voice spoke, and this is so wonderful. What did God say? He said, this is my beloved son. And then he said, listen to him. This is crucial. And all of a sudden, the cloud lifted, and Jesus was there alone. Moses, Elijah were gone. The message couldn't possibly be more clear. Jesus is the one. Listen to him. You are no longer under the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. You no longer have to be confused and befuddled about what the prophets were trying to tell you. He is the fulfillment of the prophets. He fulfills the law and the prophets. He's the one. He's the Messiah. He has come into the world. He is my beloved son. And because I love the world, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what it says. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you shall have everlasting life. You don't have to earn it anymore, as if you could. You're not going to be saved by keeping the law, which is exceptionally good news because nobody can keep it. Nobody's that good. We couldn't keep the law in a million. We violate the law every single day. We all sin and fall short, even short of the glory of God. It, I've said this before. It wouldn't be so bad if we just sinned in deed. We could, you know, maybe. Well, no, I haven't stolen anything today. Let's see. I haven't, uh, I haven't punched anybody in the nose today. Hmm. I said goodbye in a nice way to my wife. I didn't hit her. You talk about some of this nonsense going, what's the matter with some of these men? <coughs> Bums. Any man here ever slugged his wife? Well, if he did, don't raise your hand because I'll come and slug you. <laughs> It's not just about deeds. We sin in deed, yes, but we also sin in our thoughts and our words. Oh, we can't save ourselves. We can't save ourselves by being good. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't think your way into heaven. You can't feel your way into heaven. You can't get into heaven by yourself. But that's why Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, not whoever's good enough, not who's ever smart enough, not who's ever wealthy enough, not who's ever anything enough, 
Our salvation is not about us. It's about God's grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a fallen, broken, wretched sinner like me, I'm saved. I know that when I die, you ready for this? When I die, which could be tomorrow, or it could be 20 years from now, my dad lived to be 89. So if I make it as long, I've got another 17 years. But I might not. Who knows? But here's what I know. When I die, my body's going to go back to the ground, which is a perfectly good place for it. But the minute I die, my soul is going to go out of my body. I don't know something. You think you'd be able to see your body down there? I don't know. Maybe. I hadn't thought much about it. My soul is going to go out of my body. Now, if my wife or my sons or, you know, my family's there, the doctor's there, maybe the doctor will be there. He'll be listening. Then he'll stand up and say, he's gone. You see, I have been in that situation a hundred times over the years. That's why I think more about it than a lot of you do. I've been there. I've held the hand of the person as they take their last breath. So I think to myself, well, you know, hmm, I wonder. But uh, they'll say, well, no, he's gone. You have my sympathy. They'll say, who's ever there? I hope there'll be somebody there. <laughs> but I don't know. That soldier, you know, 50 years ago, I, I'm going to tell you anyway, 50 years ago, right now today, I was in the Republic of South Vietnam. The Tet Offensive had just begun. Began on January 31st at 2.30 a.m. And the biggest battle of the whole war was at way seven miles north. We were rocketed, we were mortared. Yeah, we thought maybe we were going to get killed, because a lot of people were. It was 50 years ago. Rockets coming right into our compound. Boom. If you were in the wrong place, you were. There wasn't even going to be a body. Yeah. It would have been awful if I had been blown up. You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> 58,000. And I live with it every day. And I think about it more and more the older I get. 58,000 of guys exactly like me died. I came home, 58,000 did. Whether I died over there, or if I died 89 like my dad, whenever, my soul is going to go out of my body. It's going to be taken up into the heavenly realm. I'm going to be given a new body. So it says, I'm going to get a brand new body like unto his glorious body. That refers to the body of Jesus after the resurrection. The body that he had before was like ours. It was no different. I've said this before. When they drove the nails into his hands and his feet, it hurt just like it would if it were happening to you or me. He had a body like ours. After the resurrection, he had a glorified body. Remember that picture? He's standing like this, and Mary Magdalene is looking up at him in the garden at the cemetery. It was, that picture was in the church I grew up in. And she's looking up at him. 
He's in his glorified body. He can go anywhere, be anywhere, anytime. Just think of it. I'm going to have a glorified body. And then somehow, some way, I'm going to be at the door. I'm going to be at the gate. And Jesus is going to be there right in front of me. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, well done, my faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. That's what he's going to say. Now, you know that I haven't just, of course I do like to talk about myself. <laughs> no. All, all of us preachers, we're a little egotistical or we wouldn't be preachers. We're broken, sinful people. I mean, that's no doubt about it. But you see, I've been talking about this because the same thing is going to happen to you. If the same thing is going to happen to you, it's not going to happen to me. And it means that I will have spent my whole life telling a lie. And you will have spent your whole life listening to one. It's going to happen. You're going to hear the words. I kind of think he's, I kind of think he's going to maybe even put his hand in my head. And he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what he's going to say. And he's going to say, enter now into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because Jesus is the one. And then the text ends. And it says, let me read it. If it says it here, it happened. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them. Jesus only. I love that. I love that. I've, I've been sometimes entitled my Transfiguration Sermon. <clears throat> they used to have both to write Jesus only. He's the one. He's your Savior. And He's mine. And because we believe in Him, the day will come when we shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.